This morning we are beginning a new series, a brief series. We're going to be doing uh, six weeks looking at the five solas of the Reformation, the five sola statements. Uh, October 31st this year is affectionately the 500th anniversary of the Reformation. Uh, according to tradition, it was on October 31st that Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses to the door of the Castle Church in Wittenberg. And so it's the day that we celebrate as the 500th anniversary of the Reformation. However, as we're going to see over the next six weeks, and really I would encourage us, I have a number of really good books and resources and uh, other sermons and, and, and stuff that if you're interested in this to further pursue study because it's good for us to know from whence we have come and the history that's behind us that kind of girds up our faith, that the Reformation wasn't just one day. It's not just like nothing happened and all of a sudden Martin Luther said, I'm going to nail this piece of paper to the, to the door in the church. The centuries leading up to this event, you could see the rumblings of Reformation begin historically. That there were men who saw what was going on, saw some of the practices of the church at the time and realized something's wrong here. We have strayed from biblical orthodoxy. And so even before Martin Luther, you have men who stand up uh, in reform of the church and pay for it with their lives. Uh, in the 12th and 13th century, and you see the beginnings of reform in Italy and in England, uh, in, 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 in Prague. And so we're going to see over the next number of weeks, it's not just one day, but it's this process of God working to bring about what I think historians call the greatest revival in the history of the Christian church was around this time, a revival that people now for the first time were able to see and read and hear preach to them the word of God. And they were genuinely repentant for their sins. And God did an amazing thing in his church through the events leading up to and kind of sparked by what Luther did. And so the reason why we esteem highly that day, October 31st, 1517, is because that was the day where all this stuff that had been quietly building and building kind of reached its climax, and then the fallout of that over the next four or five years and what Reformation did in Europe, it all started with Luther doing what he did. This was kind of the doorway into this massive reform and this huge change in terms of landscape of the Christian church. And so it's one of the reasons why we kind of esteem and call out that day. Out of the Reformation... So out of these centuries and centuries of this growing reform and this, this, this revival in the church uh, come five pillars of faith and theology. Five pillars of faith and theology that weren't actually systematized by Luther. He didn't sit down and write these five. But it was after the Reformation had happened and, and things were taking place and you saw divisions in the church as a result of this. Divisions for the right reasons, by the way. Good divisions that come out of this, you have men that begin to systematize, well, what is it the reformers really stood on? What were the important issues? What were the things that drove this whole reformation? And so it's boiled down to these five pillars, the five solas of the reformation that these men, many of these men died for, and they died badly for, uh, and, and were excommunicated and branded as heretics. Some of them were sought after and had to flee for their life and were kidnapped by friends so that they could be put into hiding. So it wasn't just like they could write a blog article and say, this is what's wrong with the church. Uh, some of these men paid dearly for what happened in history. And, 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 and what happened was really built on these five principles, these five pillars of the Reformation that undergird our reform faith and undergird evangelicalism. So very, very briefly, this is a side note. Evangelicalism doesn't have anything to do with evangelizing per se. Uh, the Greek word for gospel or good news is euangelion. And when you take that and when you translate it into German, which Luther did, and then transliterate that into English, what you have is evangelical. So evangelical basically is those who are committed to the gospel and the truth of the gospel and what it stands for. So people were using the word evangelical around the Reformation. This isn't something that happens in the last hundred years. So for 500 years, those who are committed to the gospel and to the word of God have been called evangelical because that's what we, 
That's what we hold to. So we're going to examine those five pillars together. I think it's important for us as a church to understand a few things, to understand the history that has been laid before us. I think if you talk to most Christians about church history, it kind of goes all the way back to like Billy Graham. Like that's where it starts. That's where even, that's where Protestantism starts with Billy Graham. And then here we are now and there's, there's a few things. And there was this thing that happened in Germany with some reformers and Spurgeon. And that's kind of the extent of the understanding of this massive history, this tradition of faith that we benefit from. So here we are, you know, 2017, and we benefit from what happened in history. And it was of crucial importance for us. And so we're going to examine the events leading up to, and we're going to look at these five pillars and see what these men stood and died for, and how we must stand as well on these same pillars. We believe them because they're true biblically, and we're going to examine what was going on around that time, how these men faced persecution for their beliefs, how there was a whole system that was against them. And I would argue that today, as believers, it's the same kind of situation, that to stand on biblical truth, to be evangelical in our world today, is to put yourself at enmity, not just with the world, but with the vast majority of what calls itself the Christian church in the world. That it puts you on the outs. You're a pariah. You're an outcast. You're an extremist. You're a fundamentalist. If you simply say, I believe what the scriptures teach, and I believe in these truths that men have believed and died for over history, that makes you a little bit of a, of a, of a crazy Bible-bashing, narrow-minded conservative. And so we face the same opposition from the vast majority of what calls itself the Christian church if we simply say, no, we, we believe these things to be true. And so it's important for us to study that that was going on 500 years ago. It's the same thing, what these men faced because they simply would not waver in terms of biblical convictions. So it applies to us today. Historians kind of vary on what they would say the main issue was or the main thrust of the Reformation. I think that there are minor differences, but I think overall most historians, most theologians would agree that if you had to boil it down to one issue, like what drove the Reformation, it's the answer to the question, what is the authority and who is the head of the church? That's the question. What's the authority that determines what we believe and what we do and how we operate? And who is the head of the church? And it was people discovering, right? It was Luther reading through Romans and Galatians and the Psalms, discovering for the first time something that had been hidden from him, even though he'd been serving as a monk for 10 years at this time. He'd entered in the monastery 10 years prior. And, 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 and what, what was revealed to him was this issue. And, and you look back at the early reformers, guys in the 1200s and the 1300s, the issue was, what is our authority? What determines what we believe and how we operate? And who is the head of the church? 500 years ago, so around the time of the Reformation, the church believed that the scriptures were infallible. So the church believed that the scriptures were authoritative, at least in principle and on paper, that they were authoritative, but the church did not believe that the scriptures were the only infallible authority. The church believed that the Pope also was infallible and that he also was of supreme authority, not just equal to, but above the scriptures. So if the Pope decreed something that was not so much in line with the scriptures, the church believed that if such a discrepancy arose, the Pope would win the day in terms of his decree. Maybe we need to rethink or re-understand what the scriptures are saying. There's a very famous story with um, William, T sorry, John, I think it's John Wycliffe or William Tyndale in England where he's having a discussion with regards to what the scriptures say. And you have these bishops or the, 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 these uh, aristocrat, aristocrats, who are, aristocrats who are saying, okay, but what if... You know, but the Pope says this, and, and Tyndale, 
um, I think it's Tyndale says, well, what if what the Pope says and what if the scriptures say are opposed to each other? And then there's this famous scene where the people respond, well, then let us, let us believe and follow the Pope and let us kind of, you know, leave behind the scriptures and what they would say. And that was the belief at the time, that the scriptures were infallible, but not the only infallible authority, that the Pope was also infallible. The church also believed that history and tradition carried a massive amount of infallibility with them. You'd look back at the church fathers, you'd look back at previous church councils, and the things that they had said and decreed were authoritative and carried weight. And so you have all these, all these different levels of authority and infallibility in the church. And that doctrine could be determined not just by the Bible. The Pope could determine doctrine. Church councils in history could determine doctrine, not just the scriptures. Now, this is something that is still believed by the Roman Catholic Church and good practicing Roman Catholics today. That while you have the scriptures, at the end of the day, it is the Pope who is of most authority. It is the Pope who is the head of the church, that he is the vicar of Christ. He's Christ's substitute here on earth. He's the, he's the pontiff. He's the bridge between us and God. And if he decrees something, even if it seems the Bible might say otherwise, he wins the day. And maybe we need to rethink the Bible. And so this was the issue that drove the Reformation. You had the church at the time saying that the ultimate authority really is the papacy, it's, it's the pope, it's the traditions and the history of the church, and the scriptures, even though they're authoritative, are kind of sub-authoritative. They're, they're a step down. And the reformers, from Wycliffe to Johann Huss to, um, uh, you know, and then you, then you had the, the second wave of reformers, you have Calvin, all these guys, all these reformers coming to the scriptures believe no. No, there is one authority, but it's not a man, and it's not a system. That what, what must be authoritative is the scriptures. That scriptures must be the highest and only infallible authority within the church. Today, you have people who would say, you know what's really authoritative? Like personal experience. So if people say, I have a personal testimony. The, the Holy Spirit is testifying to me personally, and so it's true even though it doesn't necessarily jive with scriptures, well, it doesn't matter that that's secondary. Even today, people would say, the scriptures are secondary to my personal experience or scientific discovery. What we discover scientifically, that's the authority, and now we need to rethink or remassage the scriptures. Maybe it's not literal. Maybe it's an allegory. Maybe it was seven periods of time. Maybe you need to rethink this because this isn't the supreme authority. Science is or philosophy is, or other ideas, or, or practices of psychology. All these other things are authoritative in determine how we how determining how we live and what we believe. And the scriptures are important, but not as important as all of these other things. This is very much believed today by those inside and those outside of the church. The reformers, on the other hand, believed and would affirm what we know now or what we call now the doctrine of sola scriptura as the final authority and so this I want to give this right off the bat before we get into our text because it's going to help us understand things better this is uh, a definition this is how we would describe the doctrine of sola scriptura it's the first blank in your notes the scriptures alone are the infallible and authoritative rule in all matters of life, faith, doctrine, and practice for the follower of Jesus. So it's not just that the scriptures are one of many infallible rules. It is the only infallible rule. Now, what's, what, what I want to clarify is there's a difference between, and I might say this and you might go, whatever, there's a difference between sola scriptura and solo scriptura. Solo scriptura is that the scriptures are the only rule, period. Forget about history, forget about tradition, forget about the witness of the Holy Spirit, forget about all that. It's only the Bible. It doesn't matter what anyone says or what anyone's done historically. 
just the Bible only. We don't affirm solo scriptura. We believe that history is important. We believe, obviously, that as the, the, the testimony of the Holy Spirit is important. But all of these things are subordinate to the scriptures. The scriptures are the only infallible rule. People make mistakes. Popes err. History isn't always correct. So the scriptures are the only infallible rule. In all, and infallible and authoritative in all matters of life, faith, doctrine, and practice for the believers. That's sola scriptura. So when I'm trying to understand how do I live, what do I believe, how do I operate, what do I do with my time, my money, my family, at work, at church, whatever. At the end of the day, the ultimate authority that determines that, under which all other sources must be subordinate, are the scriptures. The scriptures are the only infallible and authoritative rule for all of that. That's what the reformers affirmed. That is the doctrine of sola scriptura. So with that, let's get to our passage, 2 Timothy chapter 3, starting in verse 12. Now just to give a little bit of context, Paul has just finished writing to Timothy about his own persecution, his own suffering and what he's going through. I mean, he's in prison. 2 Timothy is probably Paul's last or second last letter that he writes before he eventually dies, that we have. And so he's, he's close to the end of his life, and I think he, he kind of knows it, right? As he talks about, I've, 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 fought, I've run the race, I've fought the good fight of the faith. He knows that, that his time's coming to an end. And so he writes this letter, and this is what he says to Timothy after he's kind of talked about his persecution and his suffering. Verse 12, Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted while evil people and imposters will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. I wonder how the early reformers would have responded to and read a passage like this in light of what was going on. Here they were believing we're standing up for biblical orthodoxy. We're not trying to upset a system like Luther's desire originally was not to break from the church. His desire was not, let's start a new thing. His desire was to bring about reform within the church. He was hopeful and hoping that by getting people to focus back on the scriptures, that there would be a change from within the church, from the top down. It's only when he realized that that was not going to happen. It's only when he realized that the opposition was so great, that the system was so, so unmovable, that these beliefs were so entrenched, only then, and Obviously, then the Pope issues a, a bull of excommunication and says, Luther, you're a heretic. So at that point, he really didn't have any, any choice. But his desire was not, let's do a new thing. It's, let's come back to what's true. And so here are these men, here are these reformers, wanting to affirm the scriptures, wanting to affirm the glory of God, wanting to focus people back on the word of God. And yet here they are under immense persecution. They're called heretics. They're chased down. Some of these guys are burned at the stake, right? Some of these guys are quartered, which basically means you tie a horse to each of your limbs and then tell them to go in different directions, right? Like they, they pay immensely for this. And so when they read this passage, I'm wondering what the reformers would have thought when they read this. All who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. I'm sure they thought, yep, yep. We desire to stand on what's true biblically, and we will suffer for it. Very, re like in, in very realistically, they suffered for this. And so not just for those early reformers do I think that this is an interesting passage, but for believers today, for those of us today who believe what the Bible says, we believe that this is what it says and this is what it means and we affirm that to be true. To follow Christ and to hold the scriptures as supreme. To say that the scriptures are our final and highest authority will put you at enmity with the world. This is what Paul is saying and this is what I think history has revealed. To side with the scriptures as being our final authority in a desire ultimately to love and pursue and honor Christ 
will mean the world will hate you for it. And I think what we have seen growing over the last 100 years, 50 years especially, is that many within the walls of churches who say that they're Christians will also hate you for it and will also come against you with a ferocity because you simply say, I believe what the Bible says and I believe that the Bible is the final authority. Yes, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. There will be opposition when we say the Bible is what it says it is. It is our highest and final authority. Now when Paul says here in verse 12, while evil people and imposters, what he's doing here in the language is he's actually painting a contrast. So if those who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, on the other hand, those people who do not desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus, those who are evil, who are imposters, who are pretending that they like the Bible, pretending that they love Jesus, whether they're aware of it or not, maybe they're intentionally deceiving, maybe they themselves are so deceived, they think they're saved and they're not. For them, I think the, the conclusion based on the language is Paul would say, but they're not going to suffer for it. They're not going to be persecuted for it. They're going to go on from bad to worse. They're going to continue to deceive others. They're going to continue to be deceived themselves because they don't esteem highly the scriptures. They don't actually love Jesus. It's going to be easy for them. It's going to be easy for them. And they'll continue to lead many astray, continue to pursue disobedience. And there's, this is the contrast between those who love the Lord and love his word. And then those who don't love the Lord and pretend to love him and pretend to love his word. If you want an easier life, reject sola scriptura. You want an easier life as a person in general, but as a Christian and as a churchgoer, if you want an easier, more pain-free, less bumpy life in existence in church and outside the church, simply reject that the scriptures are the only infallible and authoritative rule in all matters of life, faith, practice, and doctrine. Just deny it. It'll be easier for you. It'll go way easier for you. Just imagine all the difficult conversations you don't have to have with people because the scriptures don't bear a weight on you because they're not really the rule or the standard. We don't have to really listen to what they say. They don't actually determine the way that we live. That will make for a much more pleasant existence if you reject sola scriptura. Prosperity preachers are successful and comfortable because they clearly reject sola scriptura and esteem highly their own experience or they twist the scriptures and don't let the scriptures speak for themselves, and it's much easier for them and much more comfortable for them. Comfortable, compromised churches that might say, if you read their statement of faith, we believe that the scriptures are the infallible and the errant word of God. That's probably in every single, or they'll use other words. The scriptures are authoritative. You read any statement of faith of any evangelical church, and there's going to be that line. We believe that the scriptures are the divinely inspired word of God, infallible and inerrant. And it's going to say all that on paper. But on pra in practice, they don't believe that. They believe that being comfortable and popular and keeping butts in the seats and not, not wanting to really upset anyone and making sure that there's enough money to cover this and cover that, that's really what's most important. And the scriptures, you know, we'll preach and we'll throw a verse in here or there just so that you know, people don't realize we actually don't love the scriptures or Jesus. We're trying to make it seem like everything's okay. That will make for an easy, comfortable existence where you don't have to sit down with someone else from your church and say, hey, I heard this, I saw this, and the scriptures bear a weight on our lives that we need to do things differently. We need to repent here. We need to change this here. Why? Because the scriptures are authoritative. If you don't live that way, be easy and comfortable as long as you reject sola scriptura to be biblical is to be hated by a great many people this this is something the reformers knew very well and something that i think is growing because 60 years ago 100 years ago in north america and in europe a little bit before that 
there was just kind of this overwhelming wave of, oh, we're just Christians and there's prayer in the school and everyone knows what the Lord's Prayer is and God exists and so we should do what the Bible says and go to church because my parents said so. We're past that. Those days are long gone. We are in a post-Christian North America now where it is not easy to be biblical, but very difficult to be biblical and to affirm the scriptures. Verse 14. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Following Jesus... And believing the Bible is costly. Many will hate you for it. Others will deceive and be deceived themselves. And Paul says to Timothy, but as for you. So this is going on over here. It's difficult. Many will hate you. You have all these deceivers and imposters. It's easy for them. Fine. Forget that. For you, Timothy. But for you, however... Continue in biblical faithfulness to Christ. Don't get caught up in that. Don't get so caught up with the fact that it's going to be difficult and costly. Just, right? Paul's, Paul started off in chapter 3 by saying, Okay, I know. I'm in prison. I'm suffering. Let's just, that's a given. Don't get caught up in the fact that it's going to be hard and it's going to be difficult. That's the reality of it. And don't be caught up in the fact that deceivers going on from bad to worse will be comfortable. Just as for you, be faithful in pursuing Christ in biblical faithfulness. Paul says to Timothy, know what you believe. You know what you believe. You know what the scriptures say. Know it. Understand where you learned it. You know who taught you. You know the people who have come alongside you who have also modeled biblical faithfulness. They love the Lord. They've taught you. They've counseled you. They've discipled you. Paul is also, I think, referring to himself here. You know me, Timothy. You know what I've gone through. You know my life. Know the people who have taught you. Know ultimately that God is your final teacher. Know what you believe. Know who taught you. Know what the scriptures say, which you've known. Right? Paul doesn't have to reintroduce this to Timothy. You realize the scriptures say that Jesus is God, right? Paul is saying to Timothy... You know what the scriptures say. Stand firm on the scriptures. Remember this. And you've known them. You've known them for many years. And then he says, it is these scriptures that give you true wisdom. If you want wisdom, true wisdom, which I think in context here to Timothy, is if you want wisdom in, term, in terms of how to love and shepherd and care for your people in the midst of a world that hates you for it, if you want wisdom in terms of how do I live and how do I follow Jesus in the midst of persecution and the world hates me and they're those who are going from evil to worse, they're deceiving, they're being deceived, I'm in prison, I'm going to die here. If you want to know how to be wise, that is found in the scriptures. They are that which make you wise in the midst of everything I've been talking about so far, Timothy. And not only do they make you wise, but it's the scriptures that grant true faith. How do people get saved? How do people grow in, or as Paul would say in Philippians, walk, work out their salvation? How does God save people and then work on them? It's the scriptures. It's the gospel. That's how God brings about salvation. Paul says to Timothy, and you've believed all this. I'm not telling you something you don't know, Timothy. I'm not saying this, and Timothy's thinking, you're right, I do need to stand on the scriptures. You're right, this whole time I've just thought it was useless words, now I need to take it seriously. Paul's saying, you know this, you, and you've known this for many years. Everything I'm telling you, continue to do this, Timothy. It's not going to get any easier. It's not going away. It's not just going to be an easy, comfortable ride. Right? You're... I'm going to die soon, Paul would say to Timothy. My time's coming to an end here. It's not like it's getting easier for us. You must stand firm in your faith. You must stand firm in biblical faithfulness and convictions. You must 
be so connected to the scriptures that they are at the core of you because all this is going on. You've known this for a long time. Just don't forget this, Timothy, because it's not getting any easier. Okay? This is true for us. It's not getting any easier. I don't think in our lifetime at least there's going to be this reversal. There's a chance, and you've seen this over history. You see that the church is under immense persecution, and then as history goes on, so you see this in the 4th century, then things kind of turn. And then persecution lightens up, kind of overall against believers. This happened again in the Reformation. During the Reformation, persecution was intense among believers for 100 years, 200 years. And then you have the discovery of the New World, the Puritans come over to North America, Europe calms down a little bit, and then this intense persecution subsides for a while. So that could happen again. There are ebbs and flows. It could happen that what we're about to ramp up could get intense, and then it could subside for a little bit until it builds up again. The church will grow apathetic, and then you'll have men and women who will stand up in terms of biblical conviction and say, we've wandered, and it could happen all over again. But I don't think that's going to happen in our lifetime. I don't think any of us will live to see the subsiding of what's just over the horizon for us. Maybe not our kids either. I don't think my kids are going to live to see the, okay, it's okay to be a Christian again. I don't think they'll live to see that. And so what Paul's saying to Timothy here is for us. It's not getting easier. We must stand firm on our biblical convictions and be firmly rooted in the scriptures because it's, it's not going away anytime soon. We must draw the line and stand on the right side of that line. Verse, verse 16. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. This is the next blank in your notes. The supreme authority of scripture comes from the fact of it being breathed out and divinely inspired by God. This is why the reformers held to a doctrine, an understanding of sola scriptura. Its supreme authority comes from the fact that the scriptures have been breathed out. The Greek word there is theonoustos, breathed out by God, spoken by God, and divinely inspired by God. And the reason why the reformers were so firm on this and would not budge on this is because nothing else is given that description. No person, no pope, no other book, no church council, no document, the Lord has described by saying it has been breathed out by me, inspired by me. Only the scriptures has that. Only the scriptures have that breathed out and inspired by God. And so the reformers say, if this is the only thing, if only the scriptures have been breathed out by God, if only the scriptures have been divinely inspired by God, if only the scriptures are perfect and without error and never make a mistake and never reveal untruth, then they must be the supreme authority because people do make mistakes. People have not been divinely inspired by God in all their thoughts and actions. There isn't a sense that God has breathed out his will, his wisdom, so that someone espouses it flawlessly. Only the scriptures are given that title as being breathed out by God and divinely inspired. And so here what I want to do for us very briefly is I want to define for us some words, some theological words. Um, if you were here on the Tuesday night when we looked at the Bible, I went in a little bit more detail in these. And so I'm just going to gloss through them very quickly and give the definitions because it is upon these definitions, this understanding that really sola scriptura has its foundation. Okay, so these are the next blanks in your notes. This will be on the other side. The first one is inspiration. 
Inspiration is the process by which God worked through the human authors of the Bible to communicate his revelation. With God is the ultimate source of the scriptures. No person, no thing, no document is said to have been divinely inspired by God except for the scriptures. Regardless of what everyone tells you, there was this weird guy, I can't remember his name, and he'll be forgotten, hopefully, he won't sell any more books, who was saying, I saw some blog articles, this guy was a, a self-appointed prophet, but a whole bunch of people who believed him, who said that yesterday was going to be like the first day of the end, that September 23rd, 2017, this was going to be, this, this is now the beginning, and now it's all going to come to an end. Today's, today's like no different than yesterday, so... It's so another false prophet, another false prophet, hopefully won't sell any more books, and that'll be the end of it, right? No one else has been inspired by God, divinely inspired by God, only the scriptures. The second word is this, inerrancy. Inerrancy is the position that the Bible affirms no falsehood of any sort, that it is without error, fault or error in all that it teaches in matters of history and science as well as faith. So anything the Bible says... Anything it teaches about life, history, events that happened, what we believe, there is no error. The Bible's not off a little bit. Oh, well, Pontius Pilate wasn't really his name. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John kind of had a, had a little bit of a brain sneeze and they got it wrong. No, the Bible is without error. Without error in all that it teaches about life, faith, history, science, without error. The third one is this, infallibility. Infallibility is a position that the Bible cannot err or make mistakes and that it is completely trustworthy as a guide to salvation and the life of faith and will not fail to accomplish its purpose. That the Bible can't err, can't make mistakes, so it's different from inerrancy. Inerrancy is that everything the Bible teaches is true without error. Infallibility is the understanding that what the Bible communicates and the purpose of the scriptures and our reading of it, that there's no mistake, there's no error, that it is trustworthy as a guide for salvation and understanding of how we need to live and it will accomplish its purposes. So I want to read just a few passages quickly that are the scriptures themselves affirming this about the scriptures themselves. So the first one is Proverbs chapter 30, verses 5 and 6. And this is what we read. Every word of God proves true. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. Do not add to his words, lest he rebuke you and you be found a liar. Every word of God proves true. Don't add to them. Don't say God said something when he didn't say it. Don't say God didn't really say that when he did say it. And don't take the word of God, don't take the scripture and try to change it or alter it. Because you'll be the liar because God's words are always true. Every single word is true. And the next one is Isaiah chapter 55 verses 10 and 11. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. The word of God, perfect, flawless, authoritative, true, without error, without mistake, trustworthy will accomplish the purposes that God has in why he's given us his word. So, given the doctrines of inspiration, of inerrancy, and the infallibility of scripture, it's easy to see why the reformers affirm sola scriptura. Because no other person or document is spoken of in these ways. No other person or document is said to be always true. Without error, no mistakes, no flaws. Only the scriptures are given these titles. No pope, no counsel, no experience, no feeling, no tradition, no church, no denomination. None of these things 
are elevated and have the authority and the perfection and flawlessness that the scriptures do. They're not without error. They're not God-breathed. They're not inspired. They're not always true. So the question that's, I think, important for us to ask is, what are the implications of sola scriptura? Okay, Andrew, we get it. Inspiration, inerrancy, infallibility, sola scriptura, that the scriptures are the only infallible and authoritative rule in all matters of life, faith, practice, and doctrine. By the way, side note, that would be a good definition to memorize. So I'm just going to throw that out there. I don't tell you guys to memorize a lot of things. I think it would be good to memorize what we think about the Bible. Right? So if someone's going to say, what do you believe about the Bible? Well, I believe that when it comes to all matters of life and faith and practice and doctrine, the scriptures alone are the infallible and the authoritative rule. Only them. Persons make mis people make mistakes. History can be misinterpreted. Only the scriptures are authoritative and infallible in all matters of life and belief. It'd be a good thing to, to memorize. But in light of that, what are the implications? Okay, so now what, Andrew? What do we do with this? How does this affect the way that we live? What's the point? Well, I'm glad you asked. Because Paul, in verse 16 and 17, is going to do just that for us. He's now going to unpack, this is the practical application. This is why sola scriptura matters. This is why you must be, like Paul said to Timothy, rooted in the scriptures, which are able to make you wise and believe what you've always known to be true. Okay, so, verse 16. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Paul lists four things that the scriptures are designed to do, that God's design in giving us his scriptures does four things, and he says, and here are two consequences that come out of that design. So scriptures are designed to do four things, and when those four things take place, then you have these two consequences that come out of it. This is how Paul lays this down for us. So the first thing he says is that the scriptures breathed out by God are profitable for teaching. Teaching specifically, some translations will say doctrine, profitable for doctrine. Paul is specifically talking about teaching in terms of who God is, what he's doing, and who we are. That the scriptures are profitable and really the most profitable for understanding all of this. Who God is, what he wants, what his will is, his desire, who we are, how we need to live. It is the word of God that provides everything necessary for doctrine and faith. This is not to say that other people and sources are not also helpful. So I'll give you an example. There's a guy standing up here right now who's offering exposition of the scriptures and personal examples and looking at history. And I would say, I probably wouldn't tune this guy out entirely because there are helpful things being said. I, I and Paul am not saying that the scriptures are the only thing that are profitable for teaching in terms of who God is. But Paul would agree and I would agree that scriptures are the only infallible and authoritative rule. And so everything that we would need to know about who God is, about faith and doctrine, the scriptures reveal for us while you have these other sources that aren't the Bible, that are helpful and that are useful, but must sit underneath the authority of the scripture. It is the scripture that is most profitable for teaching. Second word he uses is reproof. Now, some translations will say rebuke. Rebuke's a little bit of a, a harsher word than, than reproof, but it's the same idea. That someone who is clearly in sin, clearly in a season of willful disobedience. This is the key here. This is where reproof is different from correction, which is the next word. Reproof is a person is clearly in a season of willful disobedience and in sin. How do we call that person to task? How do you say to this person, okay, what you're doing is wrong here, and how do we hope that they will be convicted to repent? We lay the scriptures to bear weight upon their souls. 
That's what we do. Not history, not true. Again, these things can be helpful, right? I, can, I could say, for example, that historically, if you have a husband who is of a certain way, it's probably not going to equal, it's probably not going to mean a very enjoyable, fruitful marriage. And I could look at, look at historically, here's, here's a million marriages where every time the husband seems to be this way, it doesn't equal a good marriage. That's helpful. But ultimately, if I'm having a discussion with a guy, I'm not going to say, this husband did this and this husband, what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring the scriptures to bear weight upon his soul and say, let's look at Ephesians 5. Let's look at 1 Peter 3. Let's look at Colossians 3. Like lay it down and say, what you're doing is wrong. You must repent. The scriptures are most profitable for reproof or for rebuke. It's the scriptures that bear that weight. The next one is correcting. Now, correcting is different if you have someone who's veering off course, who's living and operating in such a way that's, that's not right, that's not healthy, that's not helpful, but it's not so much of a willful disobedience. It's not like they're raising the high hand of disobedience to God. It's simply they've adopted something or they've embraced a certain practice or lifestyle that's just become normal to them. And they're not actively thinking about living contrary to God's will and God's design, but they find themselves in that position. So what we need to do is we need to bring them back. The word there in the Greek is the straightening of that which is crooked, the word that's used for correcting there. Something's off. We need to straighten it out again. We need to say to the person, you might not see this, you might not be aware of this, but this needs to be dealt with. we got to bring it back over here. So how do you do that? Again, you bring the scriptures to bear. You, you show them, do you see here that God's design for human good and human joy is this? And you're doing this, and it's really not good for you. It's not honoring to God, and it's clearly not equaling your joy and your good. And so what we need to do is we need to straighten this back up. And here's the standard. The scriptures are the standard for what is correct. So it's the scriptures that are most profitable for that. Okay, teaching, reproof, correcting. And then finally, we have training in righteousness. How to pursue holiness. That's training in righteousness. How do I become more like Jesus? How do I put sin to death? The scriptures must be central in my life. It is the scriptures that lay weight upon a person's soul that force them. That's the point of Hebrews 4, that the scriptures are like a sword and they cut in the center of you and then they expose you and you're laid bare before God. The scriptures read you, your thoughts, your intentions, your motive, everything is laid bare before God. You can't hide. You are naked before him now because the scriptures have exposed you in the hopes that you will grow in righteousness. It is the scriptures that become how it is that we can pursue holiness. Okay, so those are the four purposes. Those are the four purposes. This is the design, Paul says. God has designed his scriptures that they are most authoritative and profitable in teaching us who God is, in reproving us when we are in willful disobedience, for correcting us when we might be in unconscious disobedience or in a, in a lifestyle that's crooked and off. And finally, for training us in righteousness and godliness. Those are the four purposes. That's a design. And now Paul says, and here are the consequences of that. So when the scriptures do what the scriptures do in the life of the person, when they're being employed, then you see these two things happen in the life of the person. Number one, Paul says that the man of God may be complete. The word for complete there could be also translated perfect. Now, perfect in the biblical sense, when the Bible uses the word perfect, it does not mean flawless. The word for perfect means something was created for a purpose. And when it's fulfilling that purpose, it's being perfect. So this chair was made for us to sit on it. Right? When we are sitting on the chair, it is perfect in that the purpose for which it was made, it's fulfilling that purpose. That's the word perf that we translate perfect in the scriptures, in the Greek. It doesn't mean flawless or without error. 
It means fulfilling the purpose for which it was created. So, biblically fulfilling our purpose means that in Christ we were designed to be a certain type of person. We were designed to bear the image of Christ, become more like him, grow in holiness. And so one of the consequences of the scripture teaching, reproving, correcting, and training us is that we become the people that God has designed us to be. We are made complete. We are made perfect. And we do that which we have been made to do when the scriptures do the things that they have been made to do. When we allow the scriptures to bear weight upon us and when we, in loving graciousness, bear the weight of the scriptures on the lives of others, we become complete. We become who God has made us to be. The second thing, or the second consequence, is that we are equipped for every good work. So, this is... This is the, the wonderful biblical dichotomy here. We don't just be who we're supposed to be. We do what we're supposed to do. It's unavoidable. This, there's been this thing in the last couple, in the last 40 years. Don't worry about the being. Worry about the, don't worry about the doing. Worry about the being. Well, it's not about the doing. It's about the being. This is who I am. That's great. But you can't read too long in the New Testament without seeing... The genuine faith produces good works. It's everywhere. James, Ephesians, Romans, Galatians, everywhere. It's everywhere in the New... Jesus, in the Gospels. To be who we are supposed to be means we're going to do what we've been made to do. And so Paul is saying it's this, it's this combo, this one-two combo here. That when the scriptures fulfill their purpose in you, you become the person you were designed to be. And then you start doing the things you were designed to do. You start sinning less. You start finding that sin has less of a grip like it did before. You start pursuing godliness more. Right? You are who he's made you to be. And you do what he's made you to do. To walk in obedience... Right, that's Ephesians 2.10. We are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which have been prepared for us beforehand that we should walk in them. That's, and that comes right out of, just so you know, you haven't been saved by, by works. You've been saved by grace through faith. He's done this incredible work in your life that you were dead and he's made you alive. But remember, you've been saved for good works that, that needs to come out of your life. The scriptures make us do what God wants us to do because the scriptures help us to be who God has designed us to be. Only the scriptures are given that position with authority in the life of the believer. Only the scriptures. No person, no book, no history, no tradition is given that level of Nothing better helps us to be who God has designed us to be so that we can do what God has designed us to do as the scriptures fulfill their purposes in us. The God-breathed scripture has been designed to bear consequences in the life of the believer. All of the reasons why the reformers so firmly held on to sola scriptura. Because what hope do we have to be who God has made us to be and do what God has designed us to do, save for the scriptures being the infallible and authoritative rule in our life. This is why they affirm the scriptures so highly. So in light of all of this truth we've unpacked, that the script, and I've said this before a number of times, nothing in the scripture is elevated more highly than the scriptures themselves except for the triune God. Other than the glory of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, nothing in the Bible is more exalted than the Bible itself. Nothing. God loves his word. And he esteems highly his word. And it would be wise for us to do the same. If God thinks that his word must be elevated to a level that is second only to God himself, I think it would be wise for us to also esteem highly the scriptures. 
and say, maybe God knows something about his word. Maybe we need to take it seriously. And, and the reformers knew that, and they died for it, so that they could hand to us this heritage of faith 500, 600 years later, where we have accessible, like never before, the scriptures in our language, which was illegal. In 1229, it was illegal to translate the scriptures into any language other than Latin. Johann, Johann Huss was, was burnt for translating the scriptures into Belgium. In, he, was, he, was in, he was in Prague. So he was burned for translating the scriptures into the Bohemian language so that he could preach and the people could read it. And he was burned at the stake for it. So these men have laid down this history of the scriptures are important and they're authoritative. And we need to see them. We need to read them. And then we have like 12 Bibles. I got a, a shelf full of Bibles there. 500 years ago, we would all be rounded up and killed for having all those English Bibles there. We take for granted the fact that these men, they esteemed highly the scriptures and they paid for it. They paid for it with their lives. So in light of all of this and the weightiness of the scriptures that we've unpacked this morning, I want to close by looking at two important things in two areas of application and further intentional thought for us. And the first one is this why it is that sola scripture is so important in terms of what it is that we fight against. What is our battle? What is our fight? How is it that the seeds of reformation, I think, are starting to sprout in our culture? How it is that the things that drove that reformation in the 12th, 13th, and 14th century are things that are happening? And I believe also that God through those who are faithful to him and to his word will be committed to a similar reform, a similar standing on biblical truth and orthodoxy. So what is our fight? The scriptures are under assault in a way we haven't seen in the last 500 years. Other than in the Reformation, and then in the Reformation, I would say in the 4th and 5th century, there was a huge, huge issue of what was and what wasn't scripture. There was a massive assault historically. Big assault on the scriptures around the time of Martin Luther. And I think for 500 years, generally speaking, it's been fairly easy and, and, and comfortable to be a believer. And that the scriptures have just been believed. Don't have sex before you get married. Why? Because the Bible says so. Okay. That was the case 50 years ago. That's not the case anymore. That's all I need to say because the Bible says it. Well, if the Bible says it, I got to do it, right? It's the Bible. That's not the case anymore. So the scriptures, unlike ever before, are under assault. And it's not just among the common church folk. In the world of scholarship, in the academic world, there is this massive attack on the authority and the reliability of the scriptures. And so you have the majority, and this is the, this is the truth, in the majority of what would call themselves evangelical seminaries, you have people teaching Moses didn't write the first five books of the Bible. He didn't really write the Torah. It was written in the 7th and 8th century BC, long after he was dead, by four different writers. You have four different authors, and they just they call them out by letters. I think J.W., and they have the four different letters, and these four people kind of collaborated to write the first five books of the Old Testament. Moses didn't write it, and if you believe that, you're an unacademic fool. This is what is taught in the majority of what would call themselves evangelical seminary by Old Testament professors. Moses didn't write the first five books of the Bible. People will fight for the fact and the position, for example, of the Roman Catholic Church is that Genesis, most, Genesis is mostly allegory. Adam and Eve weren't real people. They're just a type of person that communicates you know, the, the, the story of humanity and the struggle with sin and temptation. There, there were no Adam and Eve. They weren't real. The flood didn't really happen. And if it did really happen, it was much more of a localized flood. If it happened, but it didn't really happen. These things aren't real. And then all of a sudden, for some reason, when we hit Abraham, then, okay, now we're actually in history. But other than that, everything, the, the first, first 14 chapters of Genesis, it's all allegory. Not to be taken literally. Right? This is, and this is happening in seminaries. Christians are being trained. Oh, Genesis is just a, it's a fun story. Not actually real. Under attacked. It's not reliable, it's not accurate, or it's been corrupted. The scriptures have been changed. They've been so altered, we don't have the real scripture anymore. We just have this fake version of it. 
and you have many attacks coming from within the Christian church. You have many prominent figures in evangelicalism and in Christianity who are attacking the reliability of the scriptures. And so I'm going to call some of these guys out by name because I think it's helpful for us to know who's saying what in terms of the role that they play. So Andy Stanley does not believe that we have to affirm the virgin birth. That Mary either wasn't a virgin or there wasn't this you know, divine that we can deny the virgin birth and that's okay. That's not really the more important part of the Bible. The Bible's not as authoritative. You know, we need to look at history and apologetics. The Bible, not as important. This is the second largest church, church, quote unquote, in the United States, North Point. And here's this prominent figure, son of Charles Stanley, who some of you might know, saying, virgin birth, we don't have to affirm. The Bible, not... You look at their statement of faith, everything looks good on paper, not when it comes to practice. N.T. Wright believes that inerrancy is just a silly North American doctrine. It's just this weird North American thing that we affirm that no one would have ever affirmed it or worded it the way that, that, that others would have historically. Inerrancy is just an American thing. We, we, don't, we can't look at the Bible that way. Rob Bell, in his most recent book about the Bible, affirms that Jesus' death wasn't actually an atonement for sins. Jesus was murdered, and then his disciples simply interpreted his death in light of the Jewish sacrificial system. But the death of Christ really wasn't about the atonement for the sins of God's people. That's blasphemy. But very prominent figure in evangelicalism, totally flipping on its head the Bible and how we understand it and how we trust it. Recently as well, you have, though he's tried to backpedal, but I think he backpedaled because Lifeway pulled all his books off their, off their shelves. Eugene Peterson said, I would officiate a homosexual wedding. I think that if you have believers who are faithful to each other in a homosexual union, that's okay. God's okay with that. And then he said that. And then there was this wave of evangelicals saying, what are you doing? And then he said, no, I really didn't mean it. It was, you know, it was caught off guard. And, and then, but what, what he won't tell you is that recanting of his came the day after Lifeway said we're not selling your books anymore you have prominent figures in evangelicalism in the church who are telling all of us you can question the bible and what it says and how we've understood it historically it's not as reliable or as authoritative as people would have you believe this is what we're being told and because of their prominence and because of their fame and their church size and the books they've written or because they're very scholarly professors in seminaries, we all just have to believe them. They are attacking the inerrancy, the infallibility. They are attacking the doctrine of sola scriptura. And you need to understand, this is our fight. This is what is coming against us, inside and outside the church. The scriptures, not that important. Not that authoritative. We need to stand firm on what we know to be true biblically, and we affirm the doctrine of sola scriptura. That's the first thing that we need to think on. The second one is this. What is our personal response to the doctrine of sola scriptura? So this is the more uncomfortable part for us this morning. How do I individually respond to the fact that the doctrine of sola scriptura affirms that the scripture alone is the authoritative and infallible rule for all matters of life, faith, practice, and doctrine? What does that mean for me? And this is nothing new. I'm not going to say something in the next couple minutes. You're going to say, wow, Andrew, you've never said that before. So you're going to hear a lot of stuff that I've said over and over again. But it is timeless and timely what we need to hear. It's timeless and it's timely. If the Bible is the God-breathed, authoritative word of God, and we believe that it is, I hope, if you believe that the Bible is the God-breathed, authoritative word of God, number one, you must read it regularly. You must. What, how could you not? God has said, I have breathed this out through the hands of men and preserved it, and I have had my people shed their blood so that it's preserved, and now you have it. And it's the only thing that's going to teach you who I am, what I desire, how you need to live. This is how people get saved. This is the only hope you have for sanctification. And we say, 
yeah, but I don't have time for it. It's so silly. Of course we must engage with it regularly. It is the word of God spoken to reveal him for our growth, for our holiness, for our salvation. We must read it regularly and intentionally. To neglect that is to, and this is the truth, to reveal we don't actually think it's as important as God says it is. He says his word is important. And if we take him seriously, we'll make it important. That's the first thing. And you're thinking, there's more? There's three more. I know. Buckle up. The second one is this. You must memorize it and hide it in your heart. You must. And I've heard all the arguments. I've heard, yeah, but I have a tough time memorizing. It's a little more difficult for me. I don't memorize. Andrew, your brain, you're almost, you're almost sick in terms of the way your brain works and you can memorize. My brain's not like that. Fine. But I guarantee you there's a lot of things you've memorized. There's a lot of phone numbers or names or dates or addresses or rosters for teams or for your work. I'm sure there's a lot of protocols and steps that you've memorized. There's a lot of things that you know this and you know this. So again, my brain's a little, you know, woohoo. But the other, other, other guys I work with at Costco, I'm sure that if they were to close their eyes, they could visualize the entire produce department. Yeah, it's apples here, then it's pears here, it's this type of apple, then this type of apple, and then we have it on the other side. And if they were to close their eyes, they'd be able to memorize that. That is no excuse. Yes, some people have an easier time memorizing than others. If you have a difficult time, start eating more tuna, get those omegas in, strengthen the part of your brain that, that, that's about memory. You must memorize and hide the Bible inside of you. Because when life happens and you can't say, let me pull out my Bible, what do you got? Other than what's hidden inside of your heart. Other than the word that springs up in these situations. This is happening. Okay, I know God's, I know, I know he says this. If you're sharing the gospel with someone, you don't have access to a Bible. Oh, I think the Bible says Jesus died for our sins. And so if you, like, we must memorize and hide the word of God deep inside of us. We must. If it's the authoritative and inspired word of God, we must. If it's just another book, who cares? But if this is the God-breathed, authoritative word of God, yeah, we must memorize it and we must hide it inside of ourselves. Third one is this. You must discuss it with believers often. Not just on Sunday. Not just because Andrew preached a sermon. And not just because on groups we have to talk about it. On Tuesday and Wednesday nights. The converse this is what Paul says in Colossians, right? This and, and this and, and this singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. This idea of the scriptures are a part of our speech as believers. We talk about what it says and what it means and how it affects us. We encourage one another with scripture. We admonish one another with scripture. That's what Paul says in Colossians: Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with thankfulness to God. Right? That's, this is what we do as believers. We talk about the Word of God. You talk about other books. Hey, I read this great book. You talk about movies. You talk about sports. And I'm not saying don't talk about those things. I'm not saying forget all that. What I am saying is the Scriptures must play a dominant role in, in what we talk about in our conversation. If it's the infallible word of God, if it's not, then who cares? But if it's God breathed, it would be wise for us to talk about it. And this is the last one. You must share it with those who don't know Christ. That's what Paul says to Timothy. It's the scriptures that make you wise for salvation. How's someone going to get saved? How are they going to get saved? They're going to get saved when they're confronted with the gospel which is revealed for us in the word of God. You must share it with non-believers. Not to say to them, hey, don't lie, because the Bible says don't lie. Don't call them and say, I expect you to live like a believer even though you hate God. That's silly. But we bring the scriptures to bear because we hope that the knowledge of God that they are suppressing, 
that as we reveal the gospel that we can pry up their hands and this truth they're holding down. Oh, he's not there, even though they know he's there. He's not there, and I don't believe him, and he's, he's not there. And if he were there, he'd be really even. They're suppressing this truth. That's Romans 1. They're holding it down. No, I won't believe him. I won't live for him. He's not there. Well, how are you going to pry their hands up? Not through apologetic arguments, not through history and philosophy. What's going to pry their hands up is, is you bring the truth of the word of God to bear on their souls. And the hopes that the gospel breaks that hard heart and it just begins to pry the hands up. So that no longer do they suppress the truth. They say, yeah, he is there, isn't he? He is good, isn't he? He's not evil like I said he was. That is the only hope we have in reaching the lost. If the doctrine of sola scriptura is true, you must read the Bible regularly and intentionally. You must memorize it and hide it in your heart. You must discuss it with other believers. And you must share it with those who are lost. This is the appropriate response to the doctrine of sola scriptura. Where you do not do these four things in your life, you reveal that you don't actually believe what the Bible says about itself. Where these four things are lacking, the truth is revealed. Perhaps you don't believe the doctrine of sola scriptura as deeply as you might say with your mouth. Because if you did, we'd see these four things. And I'm not saying flawlessly. I'm not saying every time you open your mouth to a believer, you're quoting the Psalms. That's not the expectation. But we will see these things happen. We'll see growth and movement in this direction. We'll struggle, we'll sin, we'll fall short, but we'll see these things happening because we believe that the scriptures breathed out by God are infallible and authoritative. And the only rule for life, practice, doctrine, and faith, I, keep, I hope I keep saying that enough times, you'll realize maybe I should memorize that. Yes, you should. You absolutely should. The scriptures are the word of God. And listen, that might sting a little. For me to say that, where these four things are lacking, so is lacking your high estimation of the word of God. That might sting, but I love you too much, just coddle you. Oh, it's okay. Oh, you'll get better. Oh, don't worry. I'll just love you and you'll get it one day. No. I've been commanded by God to take the scriptures and weigh them upon your soul. And so you go, ugh, that hurts. I don't like that in hopes that you will say, I need to repent. I need to repent. I need to, I need to re-estimate things. I need to take stock of what I believe and maybe I need to recommit to the scriptures and recommit to the word of God. That's, that's my goal. Not all, oh, we'll get it. No, I'm going to bring the weight on all my, listen, and I, when I say this, I don't say like I sit up here on my perch Right, Others in my life and myself, I have to welcome that in as well. I have to bring the scriptures to weigh on me. And when I have to say, you know what, it's been a few days, I haven't been in the word. It's been a week, I haven't been in the word. Right, I need to allow the scriptures to bear weight on my soul as well and say, I've neglected. I've been in a season, a brief, a lengthier season of neglect. I got to repent. I got to come back and understand the scriptures are what I believe they are. I am not excluded from feeling the gentle sting of the Spirit of God convicting us. I'm in it with us, but I'm certainly not just going to let us coast. I care too much about us and about our church, and I see what's coming against us. I see the wave of opposition. And like Gordon said on Sunday night, I'm not going to leave us ill-equipped and unprepared. I'm not just going to make it seem like everything's okay. It's not okay. And we need to stand firm on biblical truth because the world is coming at us okay the world is coming at us I want us to wrestle with three questions this morning you can write these down if you want number one do I believe and affirm the doctrine of sola scriptura I don't want to assume that we're all yep yes do I believe and affirm the doctrine of sola scriptura if so how do I see it play out in my everyday life? How do I actually see that affecting the way that I live day to day? Where that is true, how is God sanctifying me? So where I believe and affirm the doctrine of sola scriptura, 
and where I, I believe it's playing out and affecting my everyday life, where do you see God sanctifying you? Turning up the heat, allowing the impurities to rise to the surface and scooping them out to make you more like Christ. Where do you see that? Where that is not true, where do you have to repent and obey? Where in your life you say, you know what, in this area, as it relates to money or relationships or work, or this, in this area of my life, the scriptures are not supreme. In fact, I know what the Bible says and I'm just kind of sidestepping it because I don't like the weight that it bears on my soul. So where you see that, where do you have to repent and obey? Where must I change my mind and change my direction? Our authority must not be in ourselves or traditions or churches or pastors. Listen, I am not the final authority in your life. I am not. I could be wrong. And if I'm wrong and the scriptures are right, then the scriptures are right and I'm wrong. And don't listen to me. Listen to the scriptures. I'm not, not just for this morning, but in general. If I bring something to bear and you can say, listen, you're wrong, Andrew. You're clearly wrong. Don't listen to me. Please call me on it. Bring it to my attention. The scriptures are the final authority, not me. Not pastors, not experience, not science, modern philosophical ideas, Christian trends. The sole, infallible, and authoritative rule must be the word of God. Must be the word of God. And as we embrace that and walk in that, God will be at work. God will be at work in our lives.